Welcome to the MCIF, Motor Carriers Insurance Education Foundation, Truck Stop. These are monthly presentations, the second Thursday of each month at 2 p.m. These webinars are open to members of MCIF. These webinars are presented as industry updates for information purposes only and do not qualify for state CE credit. If you're seeking state CE credit, we have those available to you. Go to our website and we'll tell you where, where you can get your CE in all states. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat window. They will be answered as time allows or responded to most often after the webinar by email. If you have ex experienced any audio problems, please send us a note in the chat window or call 800-741-4084. We'll attempt to correct the problems as soon as possible. Today's webinar is entry level driving training. And we asked John Seidel from Reliance Partners, whose website's here, and I will be pleased with this. John and I go way back and, uh, and have shared a lot of information together. So uh, John, welcome. All right. Say a little, a little bit about yourself and we'll go through this, this material you presented to us. Well, I appreciate the MCIEF and everything they do because knowledge is power. And without you guys doing these kind of things for producers, underwriters, and the insurance industry as a whole, I don't know where we'd be. So thank you for that. Um, my name is John Seidel. I used to be a state patrol inspector in Wisconsin. Spent 12 years pulling truckers over at the scale and roadside school bus inspections. Then I was an investigator with FMCSA. So those conditional ratings, bad CSA scores, complaints, I was the guy that went in did the investigation, issued fines and penalties. So that was another, I don't know, 10 years. So I'm 20 years a state patrol and FMCSA investigator. Then I quit, I became a hazmat agent with the FAA. So now I'm doing hazmat on airlines. So I'm not even doing truck. After I quit the federal government, I was a consultant for about five hot seconds and then Reliance Partners called me up and said, hey, why don't you sell truck insurance and provide safety services? And I said, that's great. Um, and then a little back end, I was an Army Reservist, got activated for Iraqi Freedom, and now we're here to talk about the entry-level driver training. Good, John. As you know, you and I have been on programs together, and I appreciate your expertise in this area. And this is something new. This entry-level driver training has been with us or discussed for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, I mean, we did a program, one of the very first program I ever did for the AMGA, I'm talking about probably 15, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. had an underwriter, will you accept a driver right out of driver training school? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and so, I mean, we've been talking about that forever. And we also, a couple, three years ago, when we had the driver training school, had that qualification bill. We had people from those things, what's the school like? Even many years ago, I actually took a group of people from AMJ in a truck to a driver training school <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to see how they did it. So this is, you know, the driver's got to come somewhere. And one of the things that we have found that one of the blames for the driver shortage right now is that the funnel of new drivers were shut off because the driver training school in large part had to shut down because of COVID. Yep. And that and that started that now because there's always got to be a feeder part of this. But this is this is really new. They how long have they been talking about this? Why? I know this date was put off twice, or if not longer than that, on the February seventh date. Well, um, it's now effective February 7, twenty twenty two. And the reason it was put off, honestly, is because the states weren't ready technology wise to receive the certification that the completion occurred through the school. So they pushed it out one more year so they can improve the IT at the school. Now, they were talking about so it, the state. I mean, yeah. So the state right. would improve the IT right. that they received the certificate right. from the school. So the number one reason was the states were just a little bit behind. But now. Everybody's up to speed. There's no talk of delay in this. So then we've got what we've got. Before we talk about the future, though, let's just do this one slide right here where it talks about what we've had up till now. Now, up till now, you didn't have to go to a school. You could just get the CDL book, study it, take the test, and go and do your road test and get your CDL. There's a lot of schools, but some of them, you didn't have to go through that whole process. Now, no, the roads, for people who don't understand the CDL process, the FMCSA, or excuse me, the, the state license department will give the road test Correct. in the vehicles here to make sure they can drive. So the road test was, is done, and that still has to be done mm -hmm. when you get out of school. So the state, when they issue the CDL, the Class A CDL, will do the road test from the state inspector, what they call the uh, 
uh, like the Department of Motor Vehicles, Vehicle, they, they would, they would, that they would administer that test. Just like you do when you got your personal vehicle. Correct. But what they did in the past, up until February 7, 2022, which is basically what have we done in the past up till now, you didn't have to do entry-level driver training to get your CD. I'm here. I'm yep. You, you needed to do entry-level driver training once you got your CDL, but the onus was on the motor carrier. So in 380.503, which is effective until February 7, all motor carriers hiring a CDL driver in interstate commerce less than a year experience, the new people with new CDLs, had to do driver qualification training, hours of service training, driver wellness, and whistleblower protection. And as an ex-investigator with FMCSA, I can tell you, Many carriers fell short in this training requirement when I would do compliance reviews. The motor carriers just didn't, they, they, they just put them by the wheel yep. too often, too quick. The driver would get the CDL, even though this was a requirement, they wouldn't meet the requirements of this. And as an investigator, I would oftentimes find that they violated this because you didn't need to do this training to obtain your CDL. And a lot of the driver training schools, unquote, quote, varied in their quality. Well, yeah, um, the driver training schools would incorporate this generally into that requirement, but not all CDL drivers getting their CDL went to schools. Right. So now I wouldn't say a school is required, but as we're going to talk about it here, this is a thing of the past. You can't just do training after you get your license. You need to do it before. So let's talk about this. Yep. So basically, this is like a catch-all general area. It says you must complete driver training from a training provider, registry provider. So a school, we'll call it a school, but it could be a trucking company, it could be any third party entity. They can certify themselves with FMCSA that they're a training provider on the registry. So in order to get your CDL starting February 7, 2022 as a catch all, it says that you must be trained by somebody who is on the training provider registry. And we're later, we're gonna talk about how to get on the- 100%, yep. Later, because this would be- this so, part. so this is just a general slide to get us going. Now, here's a big part. To become a training provider, this is the section that you must meet. Now, number one, you can see I bulleted this top piece more so than any other piece, because in order to get your CDL, that training provider has to put you through a curriculum. And that curriculum is outlined in appendixes A through E, depending on what kind of CDL or endorsement that you want to get. We're going to go through appendix A in a, in a little bit of obtaining a class A CDL for the first time. That's why I've highlighted that a little bit bigger. That's to drive 18 wheel. Yep, that's to drive anything that requires a class A CDL, not just 18 wheeler. Technically, a dually pickup truck for a hot shot with a three axle fifth wheel trailer without going into it in depth because that's not what we're talking about here today. Some of those are class A CDL trucks. 26,001 GVW. Yep, if you have 26,001 GVWR combination and the trailer's over 10, right. that is a class right. A situation. Even without a tractor trailer, they're gonna have to follow that same curriculum. Okay. Now, in addition to following this curriculum, we're gonna go over pretty, pretty in depth here in a little bit, Tommy you have to utilize a proper facility. This school can't just open up in a strip mall because there's another part past the curriculum that you actually have to have a proper facility. And you, used to, you have to use proper vehicles too. And if you go to 38709 and 711, the regulation actually outlines what is a proper facility and what is a proper vehicle. Just out of curiosity, a part of this, when you take that driver test from the, uh, from the Department of Motor Vehicles, I uh, understand that you can take it in a automatic transmission or a straight or a, a shift, uh, the, the full or shift transmissions Correct. here. But if you take it in the automatic transmission, then you can't drive one with a clutch or not. And so this facility would need to have the type of trucks mm -hmm. that you plan to drive in the future. Yep. CDLs will put restrictions on your license if you don't actually do your test in the vehicle that has the most comprehensive ability to operate. Okay. That dually pickup truck with the fifth wheel and the three axles, it might be hydraulic brakes. So then you'd have a class A automatic, but no air brakes because the vehicle you took the test in didn't have air brakes, it had hydraulic. So you are right. Um, but the vehicles have to meet the regulations, so do the facilities. And then when you do the test, you have to do it in the vehicle of the type of license you want. Now a big change is utilize driver training instructors. In order to be 
a training provider, you have to utilize training instructors who are also registered and certified with FMCSA. We're going to get into it a little more in depth in a minute, but there's a theory portion we're going to talk about in Appendix A. In order to train the theory portion of the curriculum, you have to be licensed, certified, or registered or authorized by training in that state. Some state laws will say you need to be certified as an instructor in order to train in certain categories. Another state may not. The only exception to that is online training. So if you can go and do a, a Zoom training session or get maybe DVDs through the mail, like some of these third-party training providers are gonna put out for this, you don't have to be qualified in the state to be an instructor if you're gonna use online capabilities for the theory. Any policing of those by the states or uh, the government, the, the quality of those uh, videos and stuff? So I'll tell you, I knew this was gonna be a discussion of, <laughs> of where's the policing of this? Yeah. How robust is this training going to be? And what I like to do is think about hazmat training that's been here for many years. In order to be a hazmat employee, you have to have general awareness, function specific, safety and security awareness training. Those have to be provided, but they don't tell you how many hours it needs to be. They don't tell you the means in which you need to do it. Heck, you have a testing element for hazmat. They don't even give you a test. You can generate it on your own. So when you talk about policing of this, think about how hazmat has been policed over the years and how some hazmat training providers are really good and some of them just go checkbox, checkbox, checkbox. I think we're going to have a little bit of both yeah, with my, this new rate. My concern about the, the virtual part of it is they're selling these things and they pay a fee for it. If they fail too many people in that final accountability test they have to do, then they don't come back and pay the fees anymore. So right. you got to balance economics if it's too tough there. And some of them don't do the good a good enough job to educate them. And the remedial, remedial part would be good if it was face to face. But these online stuff is tough to to to, to police. Well, to make the insurance listeners here have it hit home, let's talk about insurance CE credits. Right. You can go to some um, insurance carriers and actually do live CE training or online CE training where it's interactive and they may give you a couple knowledge tests at the end where you're actually learning something. Like we do. Yeah, like MCIEF does with our CE. If you wanna actually learn something, you come to a legitimate place to learn. However, there's some CE options out there for even us as insurance professionals where you may not learn much, but you still get your certification. Equate that to this. There are some schools or entities that will provide this training, like we get checkbox CE training, and others will do it like the MCIEF does, which is legitimate and honestly trying to improve safety and compliance and understand the driver more knowledge. That's the key. Yep. But that's getting, that's the first one. That's the theory. That's knowing the yep. rule. Which we're going to get up there yeah. here. And there's a second note. All right, so now let's, we're going to get that in a second. So here's another piece, bullet number six. FMCSA will audit, investigate the training providers. Whoa, really? Yeah, so, yeah just like um, the new broker. But, yeah, but, but here's the thing. I used to be an investigator with FMCSA. We, I'll say we, I don't work there no more. We were so far behind and they are still so far behind keeping up with conditional carriers, ones with high CSA scores, that they're not gonna give assignments to go check these in my opinion. What they're going to do is they're going to wait for someone to complain. Just like if a freight broker does something wrong, they wait for someone to complain. If a random drug testing consortium for a driver's pool does something wrong, I've gotten complaints when I was an investigator and we'd investigate. But other than trucking companies, it is rare for FMCSA to have a schedule to go visit any other third-party providers in this process. Yeah, the only, I think the only other thing that might be eventually is that if the students coming out of here or go to a motor carrier or to somebody and don't have the training, that motor carrier won't hire from that school anymore. Correct. And also I can see a potentially maybe a court case where the driver wasn't properly trained and the school could be named in the suit, just like they name everybody mm -hmm. that, that might bring that up. And that might be a case for the, for the, uh, the investigator from FMCSA if, yeah. if that, Students coming out of there have a high percentage of a 
of the worst of things I had. But as you say, this is a kind of be nice situation. Yep. And when you say about um, lawsuits, I agree with you 100%. These schools could potentially be drug in or be questioned or be part of that nuclear verdict lawsuit process. I won't mention it here with a big carrier in the United States that hired a new driver, had basically on the job requirements, and I think some of you guys will know who I'm talking about. They went to the school and they didn't follow all the processes they had outlined within their own school. And that was brought up during the nuclear verdict. Right. And then at the same token, what if you have a driver that you actually got a license before February 7, 2022, and they don't perform, and they've never gone to the class? New drivers go to the class. They get all the way up. This is yeah. a part of it here. They were grandfathered. They don't perform. The motor carrier puts them in violation or on probation. Should that motor carrier then start to think about this training in developing an improvement process? So then when the lawsuits come, you can actually say, listen, I had a guy on probation. No, he didn't go through this with his CDL, but we put him through it after the fact to make him improve. I think that'll help. At least the theory part. Of it. The theory the part. part. Not yeah. to drive it. We've yeah, they've got enough experience on the road, but at least the theory to defend yourself. And then this, the last bullet here, which we're going to talk about a little bit, the electronic transmission of the certificate they completed the course, which again, that's what caused the delay to actually have this hit next month. Before you go there, yep. they still haven't got the... The physicals done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the same process. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, that part of it. So I just, I, 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 I'm hoping this rollout's ready, but uh, but uh, I just heard the other day, it might even been on you on, on Mark's show, that, that you still want to keep the physical card with you because yeah, yeah. some of them aren't sending it to the state. But I'll tell you a little, a little history lesson, Tommy, about the medical cards. Yeah. They actually made a mistake when they wrote that rule. When they wrote the medical card tied to the CDL rule, which you're referencing, they actually wrote the requirement that it needs to be tied first, then later came out with another requirement that, that the medical people would transmit it. In this case, at least they put them in the same regulation. All right. Right? So, so maybe they learned from yeah. that inadequate process from years ago. And also, just you know, the, the medical registry got hacked into, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. so I hear these words are registry and, yeah. and transmittal yeah. to, the, yeah. to the Department of Motor Vehicles of the state. And those things to this point have had a couple yeah. of failures. But let's well, talk I, yeah. I used to work there, Tommy, yeah. so nothing you're saying is surprising. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. So now. Um, there's a lot of definitions with this new regulation, but I think one of the big ones is this. Behind the wheel instructor, theory instructor. Remember I said the instructors have to be registered and certified? Well, the highlighted part in red here says what? Has at least two years of experience. So in order to be an instructor for behind the wheel, which we're going to talk about in a second, or the theory portion, which is that curriculum, you have to have two years experience as a CDL driver, right? So I think that's a big piece and piece. And these drivers will then be certified and it will reflect on their MVR. So now here is the appendices. Here's the thing I highlighted, you know, pretty substantially on that first slide. If you look in here, Appendix A is the Class A CDL training curriculum. And then they have Class B. They've got endorsement curriculums for passenger school bus and hazmat. And then they also have LCV, which is longer combination vehicles like double bottoms and triple bottoms. If you're getting your CDL for the first time after this date, you need to follow this training curriculum. And by the way, uh, this is available on the federal website. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look at this. If anybody's interested in the actual curriculum itself, it's pretty well spelled out. Yep, you just Google 49 CFR part 380. But at the end of this, there's actually an FMCSA website dedicated to this. Right. To this. So we'll show you, later. We'll show you exactly the rest of it, like what they have to go through. 100%. So I'm just going to break down the Class A curriculum. Right. We could go through each one, but there's a lot of repetition there, Tommy. So let's just talk about the first one. All right. So in this training curriculum for Class A, you got theory instruction. That's classroom. Either has to be in person or online. You got behind the wheel range. That's when they say range, they mean parking lot, right? But the parking lot has to meet the facility definition in this regulation, right? Mm -hmm. So it can't just be a little dinky parking lot, but it could be a trucking company terminal. Range is not on the road. After you pass the theory and you pass the behind the wheel range, then it's behind the wheel public road, which is a few extra tests. If you have a class B though, 
in the same appendix, it says what you need to do from a theory perspective, which is the classroom, to upgrade from a B to an A, which is not as extensive as the full theory if you've never had the license. So this is what's got to be there. And again, this has got to be done by a, by an approved school. An approved school on the registry with, with an approved, approved instructor with two years of experience. And you will not get a CDL after that date unless you go through this. Now, these are the general categories. The next slide, we're going to break each one of these a little further. Now, there's a lot of red letters there. I couldn't even fit all the different topic areas on one slide unless I made it look like this. So the theory instruction of getting a class A, it includes every one of these categories. Remember the first slide where it was driver qualification, driver wellness, hours of service, and whistleblower? And you only needed those after you got your license? Now you need to be trained on all of these in a classroom setting before you get your license. So what I like to do is look at these. Everybody just pay attention. CSA scores, we got unsafe driving, we got crashes, we got hours of service, vehicle maintenance, hazmat, right. drug and alcohol, and driver fitness. Right. Right. Those are our CSA categories, right? right? If you go through all of these, they pretty much cover all those categories. When you looked at the four bullets earlier, hours of service, sure, but it didn't have a vehicle maintenance tab, did it? No. no. Now it's going to encompass down. all areas of safety and compliance. And the important part here is things like the pre and post trip are very essential when a crash happens. Yep. If they did that or not. And, and also the maintenance. maintenance. Yep. Right. And the maintenance part of it. So, you know, that's, uh, right, that's, that's, that's important that you're going to touch. Yeah. Hours of service, fatigue. You've got drug and alcohol in here. You've got the medical requirements as fitness. You've got operation for shifting and following and, and safety, so that's unsafe driving, so it covers all this. Now, and, and there, you know, there's a point here that some of y'all might not realize too. In hours of service, there's two things. Hours of service is violating hours, but there's also a fatigue situation mm -hmm. where the driver, if they feel fatigued and all, even though they got additional hours they can drive, mm -hmm. there's a point here, and this is spelling that out or the wellness part of it. That's important for the driver to understand they have those kind of a dual responsibilities, not just to track right. the EADL information. Yep, and when you talk about that, hours of service versus fatigue, the perfect example I'll give you, Tommy, is personal conveyance. Right. In the personal conveyance regs, it says you can use PC under these circumstances. So your log's legal, using personal conveyance under those circumstances in your log. But in the caveat of the same guidance, it says, however, you can't be fatigued. Right. So even though you may be following the hours of service, fatigue could cause a problem. Now, you asked me something earlier. How many hours do you need to accomplish all these things? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is it 20 hours? Is it 40? Is there a minimum number of time that you need in full classroom instruction to accomplish this? And the answer is no. Well, no, there's no, there's no specific but, yeah, regulatory it's time. It's up to whoever is yep. the school and how much depth they want to do it. So yeah. if I want my orientation, which is the first one to be 10 minutes, I'd have to be called on that, and someone would have to demonstrate that's not enough when FMCSA and does my audit. Hours of service, what is an adequate amount of time for hours of service? I mean, me, given the fact I've been doing this my whole life, I think at least four to eight hours, just in hours of service would be what you would need to truly learn it all. Do I think some schools are gonna do an hour and call it a day? Yeah. Do I think some schools are going to be more robust? Yes, but we go back to the CE thing we talked about earlier, right? right? So these are all the topic areas for theory. So once you finish these, then we go on to the next section. And that's behind the wheel range. Remember range is a parking lot? So that two-year qualified instructor is going to have to do vehicle inspection. Well, that, well that's important here because... Early on, they had to train for it, so they'll see. Hopefully, they'll see a video of it being done. Yep. We actually have a, a, a video of doing that. So now they got to go out and perform that part. At least Correct. they're enforcing that part of it. You would point. assume that these behind the wheel range is trying to encompass everything right. they learned in theory in a practical thing, right. but not on a road yet, right. in case they're not ready to go oh, on. Right. Road. Yeah. So, and that makes sense. I right. have the guy driving around in a parking lot <laughs> before he goes out and, and starts to cause trouble within the actual public roadway. Yeah. Now, if the instructor with the experience thinks that the driver does a really good job in these areas, past his theory, then we have 
behind the wheel public road. Now we're doing a little bit more. Let's go back to the other side for a minute. Sure. Talk about facilities. I mean, if they're going to do the parallel parking blind and, 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 and those kind of things and the backing stuff, you got to have a pretty big space. You're right. And then because we're talking about an 18 wheeler, you might use a pup trailer because I think you could use a shorter, the 22 yep. foot trailer versus the 52 foot trailer. Could you not? Yeah, you could. Um, well, uh, like a double bottom trailer is 28 six. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have 48 foot trailers or right? 52. Yeah, you can so use the, the shorter one. The 48, you could actually use the 28 six and go with a real small trailer. Yeah. But here's the thing it's not what you think the facility is. In part 380, in this regulatory section that you can Google and check out, or show you the website, it outlines exactly the oh, really? physical characteristics the facility must meet. You can't have a school or a facility in a strip mall, you know, with Dunkin' Donuts on one side and in a in a laundromat on the other, with cars there, and just squeeze in between them and perform these activities. Okay. And you wouldn't meet the requirements of the definition of the facility anyway. So then we go on a public road. Now you got more to accomplish. Now the, the, the driver, trainer, or the instructor is in the cab with the um, potentially new driver. Correct. Driver. Well, yep, they're supervising and monitoring and observing these activities to ensure that this new driver passes and is fully qualified in these areas. Now, again, currently, they don't have to do this with anybody. All they have to do is get the book, study the book, take the test, go to the DMV, do your road test and qualifying vehicle and you get your license. And most of the DMV inspectors are there, they don't go through all these things. No. This, they just want to make sure the shit. Well, well, I, I can't speak for each state because right. each state is different. And you know how, if you just talk um, history, some states um, had governors end up going to prison because these schools weren't good enough, right? Um, so well, one of those, one of those, at least some insurance commissioners also. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, so I, I had so, one that took to London one time and he was in jail before I could pay him for his expense. <laughs> London, but that's beside the point. So each state is supposed to be consistent nationwide, but every state kind of has their own little ways about getting the road test done and, and issuing the CDL. But now, these have to be passed with the TPR, the product training provider, and then you have to send an electronic certification that um, that all of that was accomplished. So now that was designed, Tommy, to have a general overview of entry-level driver training, which I find funny because they call it ELDT. Yeah. And then we have ELD. Right. So you think they would have just come up with a different, different name, name instead of ELDT just to confuse the world. Right. So now one little caveat here is if you click on this link, I'll give FMCSA their credit. Recently, not when I worked there, because it wasn't very good, they hired somebody in an IT department who developed their website. And I'll tell you, FMCSA has come a long way in providing information on dedicated websites on their website. And on this one, this is the ELDT training website. Everything you need to know about everything we discussed and more is right here. So in this hour or so, we, Tommy and John and Reliance, we can only do so much to get you to the river. Now you need to drink the water. And what do you need to do? Click on this and go learn as much more as you possibly can. All right, so Tommy, they put a really good website together for us to discuss a few more things to navigate through this, right? Right. So we go to this first page, and obviously whenever you make a website, they put some key things, they get a lot of questions, they throw them on here on the first page. So that first bullet on the left, it says the ELD requirements apply to individuals who obtain their permit on or after February 7, 2022. What does that mean? That means on February 6, 2022, you go get your CDL permit, you don't have to do all this stuff. You can do it the old fashioned way and get your license all the way into August without going through this process. Okay, your permit, permit has to be, be done within six months or something. Yep, yep, yep. Yep. So That's the permit has to be done within okay. that time frame. But if you're able to get your permit before that date, so let's say, and this is kind of a point of contention we talked about, you're a mechanic. And mechanics generally don't drive over the road. In a lot of cases, they may not even pull a trailer. They're just going to test drive trucks around the block. Many mechanics should go and get their CDL ASAP. 
get your permit issued ASAP or you're going to be a mechanic going through the entire CDL training curriculum we just went when all you're really going to do is drive a truck tractor a mile or so within the confines of your location just to do test drives. Yeah, and that is not also not only that, we have a number of insurers who might have a, a, a somebody who goes picks up do some shows of tractors, You're don't right. ever get hours of service, stays local, this kind of stuff with the yep. CDL. And yep. this is this new process. We'll talk more for the end what we projected cost and timeline and all <laughs> that before we get through this morning. But that will be something here because uh, a mechanic, and golly, we need more mechanics. <laughs> You're right. Well, when you talk about golly, we need more mechanics. Yeah. Golly, we need more drivers. Uh, yeah, both. So in this situation with this entry-level driver training, what is the effect that this is going to have on a driver shortage and a mechanic shortage? And in the case of a mechanic, you may have mechanics that, like you said, need to pick up or deliver trailers. So they're 150 air mile radius drivers. They're time card guys. They don't need to know every caveat of the hours of service because it just doesn't apply to them. They don't do the pre-trip or post-trip because yeah. they don't make any trips. Yeah, other than, you know, technically, I guess, per the regs, you're supposed to do a pre-trip even if you test drive. Yeah, but the funny thing about it, the test driving a truck is already, it's, it's, see if there's a mechanical problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, like if test driving a truck that might be in violation of the first place. Yeah, that's so, what they want. So they're going to pre-trip check something, they already know what's wrong with it, right? Yeah. So you're true. So, but there's the thing about the CDL permit. Now, on the right-hand side, it talks about this includes people that are exempt from it. Okay. So in a sense, this 383.3 CDH, that's like farmers, firefighters, farm vehicles. That's not people that came from another country and are coming into the U.S. to get their CDL. The times are over. Those drivers that come from overseas, which let's be frank, there's a lot of overseas drivers that come here and drive truck in the U.S. given the shortage. Well, I'm, I'm reading a, a PCA uh trucker for their value for their uh, uh award safety they're actually importing some drivers i was in a class with scopolitis about three years ago one of their programs the one they do up in, in annapolis mm -hmm. and they were talking about with motor carriers there they're saying from the audience we need to import mm -hmm. more foreign drivers yes. if we don't have the u.s i live through the florida south florida the the, the cuban and one of the things the cubans first did was drive trucks yep coming across when they the, the migrated or coming across the mm -hmm. channel and migrated here. So this is a place where they can semi-skill but can make living here. And we have this, but so, but you might mention this farming exemption. There is a major hours of service problem here, but my understanding is as long as they're hauling within what, 150, 150 miles, miles of the farm, mm -hmm. hauling their own goods. Yep, it's not, gotta be a farm hand or a farm, a farm employee. employee. It can't be a for hire operation. Right. That's what I'm saying, of their own goods, Yes. Uh -huh. this kind of stuff, then they don't have to have a CDL. But what's interesting is occasionally farmers that slip through the cracks is with one farmer helps another farmer. Yeah, I uh, always, I always right, say, yeah. how many people get 18 wheelers or big trucks yeah. that don't haul something for the neighbor? Yeah, and all of a sudden exactly. they don't. And then that's not theirs, and technically it doesn't qualify. No, I know one I have here that I use a joke is. I think Winnebago's, if it's usually for personal, you still have to have a CDL either. Well, no it. RVs do. Uh -huh. yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. It's part of it here, even though they might need these RV haulers uh, yeah. with that car in the back. But those are the ones. That, but those, the, the volunteer fire, those are the ones we've known exceptions the whole time. Those yep. aren't new from the CDL. Yeah, one's kind of new is the military personnel. That's the third bullet here. Um, they're trying to promote military, you know, personnel that have uh experience with like mos's that do tractor trailers in iraq why can't they come over and use that experience for the cdl now what i find interesting about that is military is exempt from all the federal motor carrier safety regulations but just because you drove a truck in iraq means you don't need to learn the hours of service so it almost doesn't make any sense yeah. and you talk about nuclear verdicts what if you hire a military guy don't properly train him in the hours of service. He's got false logs or some over hours, and they say you never sent him through and you used an exception, and now look what happened. Yeah. So some of these companies need to be careful. Maybe it's a good idea to take a lot of this information and develop a program internally. Just because someone didn't have to, maybe it's a good idea. And what he's talking about here, folks, and one of the reasons we wanted John here 
is, is, is happening. Uh, in fact, we got an email uh, here in our question here about somebody who asked about the cost of this part up here. Because they're talking about some of our insurers now have internal training mm -hmm. and they bigger motor carriers. I'm sure you're insuring some of those. Yep. Now they got to qualify. Some of these schools might not qualify anymore after February 7th yep. because of depending on how much they have done to, to be here, mm -hmm. to get here. And But there is one thing coming out of this, and you are the expert in this area, John. At least the driver will be exposed to more knowledge yep. and have somebody who is in that cab with them checking to make sure they can drive and respect all these things before they're well, before you, they you can know. go through so at least there's 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 a, a different level here mm -hmm. with at least some sense of of, of, of continuity yeah what i would say is um i i actually sell insurance and work under the premise of knowledge is power and if i can help a company stay more compliant reduce csa scores control losses it ends up better for everybody the insurance carrier the broker, the customer, the shipper, the industry, the public, right? Is this going to improve knowledge for people joining this industry? Absolutely, yes. But when you talk about how much it's gonna cost, it's a supply and demand issue now. Yeah, but the email that somebody came back says it's gonna cost about $13,000. Well, maybe, depends yeah, on the school maybe. and how far it's going to go. Depends on which one you go to. Yeah, right. but you could do it virtually for, CD-ROM from somebody or J.J. Keller training thing here. Let's go back to the hazmat we talked about. If you Google hazmat training providers right now, you're going to see a wide gamut of costs to facilitate those. Just like CE. Yep, just like CE. Yep. Some of them will be more or less than others. Um, now, when it comes down to it, you get what you pay for. If the more you're going to pay, the more knowledge you're going to probably get because it's going to be a longer program that's more robust and is actually going to follow the intention of this reg in the first place. So, so that will be the subject there. So the only real uncontrollable cost would be what is the facility Correct. and the trucks there mm -hmm. and how much you're paying this driver. And another factor is how fast can you get someone through Correct. that driver because schools usually have a half a dozen, a dozen people going through the process at the same right. time. And so they're going to have to wait their turn to do the road check. Correct. And, and how many drivers, that would be what would increase the cost. Well, think about this too. These schools have only been used to so many drivers choosing a school to get your license. Right. There's been a plethora, use the word plethora. Aha. Uh -huh, plethora a of word. drivers. <laughs> it's a good Scrabble word. <laughs> um, a plethora of drivers outside the schools that obtain their CDLs. Now every driver needs to find some kind of curriculum and training facility with the behind the wheel and the behind the road. So do we have enough people available to process these drivers? And whenever you have a lack of trainers, initially in schools, that's when rates can start to go up because you don't have as many options. And uh, let me ask you this stuff, this time-wise here, uh, when can they start applying to be a trainer now now they can they can register now um and if you see on here you go up to the very top and it says training providers right this is right where you go to register as a training provider whether it's a provider or the instructor the website is ready for you to get your name and facility in here and a motor carrier can be a provider as long as they follow this curriculum yep we'll just say this anybody well, can be a provider as long as they follow this curriculum now if a state requires training people to have state issued certificates and licenses exactly. then you can just do it remotely so you can go via zoom or a dvd or recorded training sessions in each area and do it electronically for the theory and then just do the range and behind the wheel. Which most motor carriers would have both the facility and the driver and the vehicle to do the road part of it. That's and a most, great point. And, and most motor carriers anyway with a new driver does that anyway. That's a great point because 
What schools may lack is the facilities and the number of instructors to fit this bill. But a motor carrier, they got the trucks, a lot of them have the facilities, and a lot of them have drivers that are high quality, that have two years of experience. So are we gonna potentially see an increase substantially in trucking companies, motor carriers, motor carriers adding themselves to the training provider list using their own facilities to onboard drivers? But now nuclear verdicts becomes a question. Well, let me, before we get to the, the, the legal part of it, uh, you do this more often than I do, but most of this stuff you just went through the road test we looked at. Mm -hmm. Don't most motor carriers, when they hire a new driver, the, I'm talking about the larger ones who make sure, because, mm -hmm. you know, they have to do or are supposed to do the screening of the road test, go through that anyway? Okay, so let's talk about regulations. You ready? Right. Yeah. When you hire a driver, your driver qualification file requires one of two things, a road test or a copy of the CDL, the piece of plastic. Okay. You're not required to do a road test per the regulations in a CDL vehicle because the government up till now okay. has said, you know what? If you got your CDL, that means you did a road test with a qualifying state employee to get your license. Now, who's required to have a road test per the regs? Anybody operating those trucks between 10 and, and 26 right. that are still subject to these rules because they say, you know what? A 26,000 pound straight truck, that driver might've got his license in a Honda Accord when they were 16. So you must have a road test in the smaller non-CDL trucks. But once you hit the CDL size, a copy of the piece of plastic has always been good enough. Okay. Now, is it recommended? No. I don't know who would put a CDL driver in a tractor trailer without watching him drive your truck first, but it happens. Yeah, I'm yeah. but my point here is that, that maybe they combine the two together, mm -hmm. and now they're going to be more comfortable with this person because they did all the training, correct? And and and, and you know the cost they talk about thirteen thousand. It, it could be all over the board. I could see where a motor carrier could set up something, and 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 part of it, the driver might or might not have to be compensated for this. Uh, there's there's school there a lot of these schools are funded by state funding and and or uh, uh, they can finance the, the the package and forgive us student loans and this kind of stuff here mm -hmm. I'm sure we're gonna see a lot of that how in your opinion how many current driver training schools are are even up to this right now? I would say that all the legitimate professional CDL schools have already complied with this because this isn't like they published the rule three months ago. Right. This oh, has been in, working for three, four years. Yes, yeah. This has been in place for a long time and it got delayed because of the issue with the state IT that we mentioned earlier. So every school I've talked to is ready to vote. Who's not ready to go is the numerous motor carriers who've been doing this on the doing it the other way and when i bring this up to them even right now they're like what are you talking about well that was that, was that question that we yeah. got, that the email that we got how many about, truckers about right now how many trucking gummies right now have no idea that this is coming in a month right crazy and, and this and uh it's my, my, i've been meaning to do this every day coming to work joe and i both pass a driver training school <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop in for next week. <laughs> and hey, we're in trouble. And they say, "What are you talking yeah. about?" <laughs> I'm trying to stop to just, you know, yeah. I've been busy with Thanksgiving and all that. To yeah. stop in and see. Now, if they know this, but, yeah. but, but how, how there? Their facility is marginal. I got you. I mean, it's big. And so let's bring a tape measure over there and, and let's go step well, it out and see I, if it's good enough. I, 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 I will do that for you. But. All right, now put your hat on again as we as we wind this yep. down. Let's talk about as retail agent. And you do something that we encourage you to realize that's something that I encourage you to do. And as you know, my theory is you gotta sell more than the policy. Mm -hmm. You gotta offer the insured help. Yep. Now as a retail agent, talk about how you think they need to start talking about with their insured first when that insured is looking to hire drivers out of schools, and second is when the motor carrier wants to have their own school. All right, so, so here's what I say. Um, I read a lot of articles um, in different trade magazines, and you never know if what you're reading is accurate or not accurate, because it's only as good as the person explaining it to you. Um, overall, there's a lack of knowledge in DOT safety regs and compliance 
across the country. And that's not just retail agent or broker or underwriter, but it's also motor carriers. So everybody, I think, needs to increase the level of knowledge they have across the board in all these areas, because you can try to jump through the hoops and setting up a school, but how are you supposed to train on these topics if you don't know them all, right? right? So I think that we have a challenge in front of us from that perspective that, um, you know, that is going to be tough to overcome, I'd say. And so the retail agent can, can talk about this, but you've got to encourage our, uh, our uh, uh, motor carriers for the hire drivers to at least check out the quality of the schools mm -hmm. and this kind of stuff. And with this also is paralleling now with the Safe Drive Act or the new infrastructure where now that 16 to uh, what 3,000 people can go through less than 18 years old part of that too. This would be done by some of these same kind of facilities to meet those requirements for the inner driver, will they not? Yeah, I would say that's true. And, you know, the other thing you talk about younger drivers, and then we were talking about retail agents is, are we as an insurance industry going to start opening our minds to younger drivers with less experience because we know they're coming out of schools with this kind of background, right? And I I'm very interested to see that after this next six months with the CDL permit guys, that we know we've cycled through every new driver, say after August, will have gone through a more robust curriculum. Is that gonna make a difference in the driver shortage by allowing drivers with a little less years of experience because they're getting onboarded better? Well, as you know, most of the insurance companies, well, particularly younger, less experienced, also look at the motor carriers and how careful the motor carriers are in this. And the ones who are most careful are the ones who've got skin in the game. So yep. I think the first ones that are going to do this will be the ones that have large retentions, which they then have some latitude in the excess level to allow them uh, to do this part of it. And what I look at this is part this is going to help us is those people are now going to get two years experience for that motor carrier. Now they're going to be more available for our one to five or one to 20 unit yep. people, John. I think that is, is more people we get interested in this industry and more people going through this and more knowledge those people have will give us all a more comfort level because if you boil it down, as you know, it's the driver behind the wheel that makes a difference to be insurable or not. And but I hope sure. that this doesn't become cost prohibitive for some people entering the industry. You know, if you think of it this way, we're running a 1500 meter race and now they just threw a couple hurdles on the track, right? right? And I hope those hurdles aren't too much to overcome so I hope enough TPR facilities show up to provide these new drivers a means to do this properly. Well, I know a lot of them now are trying to get involved in, uh, in community colleges and, and this kind of stuff, yeah. which this would be a great entry level, mm -hmm. particularly the, the younger uh, next gen drivers. I've been looking yeah. at those. And if they years. move the age down to 18, maybe high schools could yeah, start to do this kind of thing. Of yep. I was hearing on the on uh, the radio show the other day, driving home from South Carolina from the holidays, where there's a cup, there's a, a not-for-profit now encouraging the driver, younger drivers, and the high school levels. Yeah, imagine if they made it 18, and in high school you could take the curriculum, and then go out in the back parking lot by the football field with a tractor that's there and a trailer for maybe a donated trucking company locally and get all this stuff done. And walk out of high school, walk out of high school with it, and then yeah. our shortage isn't as bad as it was, but then they're trained better than they ever have been. Is that gonna help us long-term? I say yes. Now, another thing with this website, if you wanna stay up on it, right there where it says sign up to receive email updates, click on there. I, I challenge every agent, every broker, every, every other writer, writer. Listen to us. Yeah, come on and click on this, and I'll tell you what, this isn't the only area. FMCSA has a federal register website you can sign up and they email you. Um, there's every different area of this and they'll give you updates on all this. Yeah. So this is how our insurance industry can stay yeah. educated. Now, I get, I you get guys do a great that. job, yeah. but you can't do it all. Sometimes you have to self-educate and that's why I felt it necessary to show on this website. So we asked John to be here because this is new. Is something that our insurers face every day, where to get the drivers, how qualified they are from an insurance standpoint. This is something new now that we'll have to go through. And we need to know the level that we are kicking up, at least at the federal level and regulation level and rules level of where it used to be. Whether it's going to make it better or worse, where it's going to make it harder to get in or not, we don't know. But the cost 
will be whatever you want to pay for mm -hmm. and how good you want to pay for it. Yeah, that cost. And that's going to be in, up to the schools and up to the motor carriers who are hiring these drivers out of that school. Right. To this part of it. And some other, schools are going to be like a Ford Raptor, some are going to be like an F 150, and right. some are going to be like a Ford Ranger. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you never know what you got, but I'll, I'll challenge any motor carrier, anybody, try to go towards the right ones because we're here to reduce crashes and save lives. Yeah, we want to sign up insurance, you know, we want to get freight delivered, but remember, safety comes first, and that's what this is all about. And there's one other thing that I find in this that I just came to you thinking about what you just went through as we close here. This also gives them a better introduction of what trucking is mm -hmm. before they get their first trucking job. Meaning sure. one of the problems, a lot of new drivers going through the process, look at the dollars, 75, mm -hmm. 80,000 they think they can make a year, yep. never understanding the complexity of being a driver. Mm -hmm. At least through this written curriculum and the driver training part of it behind the wheel, at least they see what the business is about. And it's not just the romantic running out of here, driving out of highway. Yep. It's more than just putting a key in there and yeah. turning the keys. And so someone might not, they say, this isn't for me. I don't want to have to get in and out of that cab that long. I don't want to have to do all this check. I don't want the government looking at me, you know, the things here that run them away in a short period of time. Yep. I'm with you 100%. John, thank you very much for that part of it, sir. We appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us always. We'll use you often. Yeah. That's a good partnership uh, there. And we hope you all got something out of this that you can take back to your insurers. And if you're an underwriter, understand what's happening now with drivers so that you, when you look at a risk, can factor in these things that we went through today. John, appreciate it, my friend. Yep. I appreciate you too. Thank you. Bye, bye. bye, -bye.